Well, ladies and uh, gentlemen, good morning, excellencies, good morning. And we, uh, it's a great pleasure for me now to have this discussion with, uh, I would say, Professor now, uh, <laughs> Minister Nabil Fami, who uh, is in his uh, current position, he is the Dean of the School of uh, uh, Global and Public Affairs of the American University of uh, Cairo uh, and uh, very well known former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of his country and uh, I would say one of the most respected uh, thinkers also in uh, international affairs uh, in the region and worldwide. He's very well known worldwide and we had many occasions to meet together, in particular, Nabil, in Beijing, yes. uh, where we, in the last few years, uh, have uh, had a regular, until the pandemic, uh, a very interesting meeting in, in Beijing uh, on, on global affairs uh, with uh, some uh, distinguished uh, Chinese uh, authorities. So, Nabil, thank you very much to have accepted, at last, <laughs> At last, my invitation to participate in the WPC. We are very proud, I repeat, to have you uh, here. And um, I would like to ask you just to, 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 to start the discussion. Uh, what uh, are your general impressions of the uh, last uh, two days, the, the, the discussion in terms of, uh, of perception of the mood? Uh, uh, of very, very various uh, people, all interested in the international affairs. This is the first, I, I remind, the first international gathering of some significance uh, taking place. I'm talking of private institutions uh, on, on international affairs uh, uh, since the lockdown and so forth and so on. So, what is your, your, your general impression b before we start talking more precisely? Sure. First of all, Thierry, thank you very much for the yeah. invitation. This is a very prestigious event and the last two days have been very informative for me that we started our dialogue in Beijing and we're actually convening in Emirates, I think, reflects also what's happening around the world in terms of Chinese prominence and uh, Emirate activism uh, and constructivism. Uh, so also thank you very much to, to the hosts uh, for doing this. Uh, this has been interesting and you and I attend many, many conferences, but it's been interesting because it's about policy. And policy ultimately determines what we do in the future. It isn't simply an analysis of history, which is useful, but not enough to move forward. The other point I really took from all this is the, there's an underlining emphasis on we have to work together. If you wanted to, to arrange an event in, in, in support of collective action, this is something that is, uh, frankly, a, a primary event in that respect. Everybody here has been emphasizing we can't do this alone, how strong or how weak we are. Uh, the third point is it's been factual, not theory. Everybody has come up with the case, given us the figures, told us the, the real facts and then built on the policy orientation. So I can tell you I've been attending the overwhelming majority of the sessions. Uh, everyone I've gained insight, information, uh, and I leave not with a sense of euphoria that we have solutions for all our problems, that would be naive, but definitely with a sense that the world wants to work together, at least the thinkers, in the world, and in that respect, uh, I want to thank you for convening the event. Well, thanks to you. I think that um, what you are saying fits very well with what uh, Dr. Gargash said uh, yesterday, because uh, when you are not, which is the case of most countries represented here, when you are not among the giants, the superpowers, uh, you, you have uh, to spend a lot of time to understand one another and to try to convince, you know, others uh, of uh, reasonable positions and includes and rule out the extremist uh, uh, 
positions. Now, uh, the, today, uh, most of the day, we'll be, uh, we'll be discussing uh, Middle East uh, issues at large, Middle East uh, in, a, in a very large uh, sense. And um, I think we have, uh, in the last two days, we have often alluded, I would say, to Egypt, but we have not discussed uh, anything precise about Egypt. Egypt is perhaps, you know, historically uh, the most uh, important, uh, not, not the superpower, but certainly the most I important uh, uh, country. I say that cautiously, I don't want to be uh, attacked on this remark. But in the Middle East, and of course in terms also of population, tradition, and so forth and so on. So how uh, would you uh, de 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 describe uh, Egypt's role today in uh, the uh, geopolitical scene of the Middle East, which has uh, been through major transformations in the, in the last uh, two years, of course, I'm thinking of the Abraham Accords, but n not only that. So, uh, with huge internal uh, problems, uh, of course. So, I think we would all be very uh, much interested to having your, 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 your view on the situation of Egypt, both domestically and externally, because one of the things that you would all agree on is uh, that it is impossible to separate uh, domestic uh, and, and foreign uh, affairs uh, entirely. Sure. Just very quickly, the Middle East generally has been a theater for international engagement because of superpower rivalry in the past and because we attracted them more than we actually should have as Middle Easterners. I say this because the world has been changing and we have been changing at the same time. When I was minister, I would occasionally joke, but it was actually true, that my nightmares were easier than my days. Because I would wake up and I would see that we have a problem on the, on the western border in Libya. We have a water problem looking south. There's no Arab-Israeli uh, uh, peace process. Problems in the Levant with Syria. You go down to Yemen, there are problems there. Issue of terrorism. A lot of things. Um, so, the Middle East has been, is has and is going through significant change, both geopolitically, because of what's happening around the world, but also regionally. And as you said, I mentioned the regional conflicts, but the transformations are also going through domestically, throughout the region, including in my own country. We had two revolutions in three years. That in itself shows you that there was a domestic desire for change. I critically, but in a constructive sense. And I say this back home, this is not something I say abroad uh, only. I've always criticized my own, my own institutions, my own colleagues. We need to be more proactive. We don't have to uh, wait for events to happen. Uh, when I moved into the academic environment, I termed it that, that a lot in the region have a generic resistance to change. And what I see different now is up until 2010, 2015, last few years, everybody in the Middle East was talking about the past. Then suddenly, with 2011 onwards, every government in the Middle East today starts off not with emphasizing the, the, their heritage, which is pr proud, but with emphasizing what they will do for their people in the future. That's also happened in Egypt. We have problems. We're looking for a secure uh, border on, in Libya. There's progress there, but it's not yet there. We uh, want to solve the, the, the water issue. Uh, there's no progress there. I'm, I'm very candid about these things. We're disappointed with the lack of a peace process between Arabs and, and Israelis, the Palestinians and Israelis, in particular, because we want peace for both, for both sides, and, and so on. Um, we were very busy domestically, because we can't argue that we had two revolutions, but it didn't affect our attention. Of course it affected our attention. You pursue foreign policy, 
uh, to achieve domestic aspirations. In other words, even if you're looking for resources, it is to solve your service requirements. And one thing which is paramount about Egypt in the past and in the future, we live on two continents, Sinai is actually in Asia. So we're, we live in Africa, Asia, we live on two seas. We import our food, we get our water from abroad, national security capacity from abroad, and we're trying to attract investment. You cannot do that without an active foreign policy. Uh, what I've seen recently, this last year in particular, Egypt is much more engaged now in trying to determine movement on regional issues. That's clear in Libya since summer, not this summer, summer of last year. Uh, just a week ago, the Egyptian foreign minister met the Syrian foreign minister, and I would say attended a very well arranged meeting uh, by Iraq at the General Assembly of regional players in the Middle East with a number of Arab players. Um, we are trying to, to engage in a dialogue, we engage in a dialogue with Turkey. Slow, it's very slow. Don't be too overly optimistic. It's very slow. Uh, I would suggest also we, we need to engage with the Iranians. And I'm always going to be a proponent of trying to push the Arab Israeli peace process in all the difficulties. So Egypt had, if you want, it faced a couple of hurdles. Uh, the strength of the system, I, mean, I doubt very few countries in the region and some broad, frankly, could have survived two revolutions in three years and come out standing. And we're 104 million, probably by the time we finish this session or this meeting, uh, tomorrow will be a bit more than, than that as well. They're not going away. 65% are younger than 25 years old. Mm -hmm. So you will see more activism in terms of Egypt. Uh, just again, yesterday I think it was announced that we're going to host the environment conference after the one in Glasgow. Uh, and we will engage with any country in the region that wants to move forward. Now you asked about changes in the, in the Middle East. Everybody's talking about moving forward. Um, there's progress on Libya, but I, I would hope but doubt that we'll have the elections in December, but I would love to be proven wrong more important for me to have successful elections delayed a month or on time is, is irrelevant uh, for me, but there's at least desire to have a, Leban a, a, a Libyan solution here. And of course, foreign interference has to decrease. Um, I don't see an Arab-Israeli peace process immediately, but there is humanitarian engagement that is a bit more than what it was in the past, but we need to move uh, on that as well. We will support all of our Arab brothers in existential threats that they face in, in, in the region. But again, we honestly believe that the way forward is to engage others, not I mean, in many ways, tough love, if you, if you, if you want. We need to be uh, looking forward. And let me seize this occasion to actually call on Egypt and the Arab countries. I think we should all speak much more about our vision for the future, for the region, what we want to see for the Middle East as a whole, uh, in concrete terms. And by the way, we don't have to agree but we need to engage in a dialogue and let's see how much agreement and how much disagreement we have. Because allowing others to set the agenda is very dangerous. Well, thank you very much for these extremely interesting uh, remarks. Now I'd like to put uh, two uh, aspects to, together to relate to two, two uh, important aspects of the current situation. On the one hand, we have at least a partial withdrawal of the or retreat of the United States. I say partial because I think we have to, we should be quite uh, cautious in describing the, the situation. 
but uh, whatever the exact term would be, the fact is that some powers took advantage of this situation to uh, intervene in uh, Mediterranean or Middle East uh, affairs in a relatively, I would say, 19th century way. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking particularly of Turkey and Russia, for and typically in, in Libya or in uh, uh, Eastern uh, Mediterranean, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So uh, th this kind of uh, development, uh, I, I, I made the point in my own introductory speech. Uh, I repeat, uh, let us uh, make us think more of the 19th century or, or pre-World uh, War I uh, uh, situation. On the other hand, the, the second point, from a more sociological viewpoint, we have everywhere in the Middle East a kind of a generation fight between conservatism and modernism. And um, one uh, of the points which uh, I admire, for instance, in this country is uh, that uh, this, uh, 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 the, the, this rivalry between generational rivalry is dealt with in a relatively smooth way and things are moving in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the right direction, but in, in a smooth way. And I think that in Saudi Arabia, they are trying uh, to, uh, to, to, to do the same. In Egypt, uh, the situation from, uh, seen from outside uh, seems to be much more complicated, maybe uh, because of the size of the population for historical reason. After all, uh, the Muslim Brothers uh, phenomenon was born in, uh, in Egypt. And um, I would like you to comment on that because uh, what happens, uh, what the future developments in, in, in your country will be, will certainly have a huge impact on the, on the rest of the region. Well, let, let me start with my own country. The basic challenge bet between the Muslim Brotherhood and the rest of the Egyptian system was about our identity. Are we Egyptians, including some Muslim Brotherhood, mm. or are we Muslim Brotherhood that have some Egyptians? That's an existential threat. And that's why the clash happened so quickly. That's actually why not only uh, political influencers, but also the middle class were actually against the, 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 the form of government that was being implemented by the Muslim Brotherhood when they came into power. The Muslim Brotherhood was born in Egypt. There will be some trends in Egypt. But the reality is, if you try to build for the future, then our youth want to be engaged in the world. I have two, three children, two of whom got their jobs internationally on the internet. I had to compete with the person next door for my job. They were competing internationally, and they were com comfortable with that. They're passionately Egyptian, but at the same time, they're part of the world. Uh, a dogmatic ideology doesn't fit Egypt. We live on two seas. We need to engage with the world. And I actually think that that uh, ideology is a threat to modernity. Uh, the influence of the Brotherhood today in Egypt is very highly diminished. Uh, and the government presently, whether one agrees or disagrees with some details of policy is irrelevant, is an activist government trying to respond to the basic immediate needs of the people, but at the same time understands. And that's why I said this last year, you saw this shift between focus only on domestic to having a self-confidence now, which allows me to host the environment conference, which allows me to engage the Turks, which allows me to engage other players in, in the region. Um, and I see that as a positive. Um, a point made by uh, Dr. Anwar yesterday, which I 100% support. We need to speak together as Arabs. We don't always have to agree. I mean, Arabs are lovely in uh, their ability to agree. Our problem is our inability to disagree. So I actually want a discussion where there are differences of opinion because understanding your opinion, understanding mine is paramount whether we agree or not, comes in second best. And the more we engage with our non-Arab partners, the more important it is for us Arabs to speak together mm -hmm. as well. So it's not at the expense of priorities here. 
Um, I see, to go back quickly to Egypt, there's clear evidence of economic progress. Even post-pandemic, we're looking at 4 to 5% growth this, this coming year, which is significant. Uh, it's not enough for us. We need to go up to 8 and 9, but you can't jump from 0 to 8 and 9. Um, just three weeks ago, we issued a new human rights doctrine. Again, it's not perfect. Human rights doctrines anywhere in the, or and applications anywhere in the world are not perfect. But it's tremendous progress. And it's reflection of we want to move forward. Um, the government is focusing on youth. Frankly, I'd like to attract some attention for our age bracket, but uh, it is focusing on youth quite constructively. So short term, it's going to be a challenge. Medium term, I'm much more comfortable. But as an Egyptian, given our weight, given the role that I think we have to play, uh, I also want us to be able to look long term and engage with our neighbors. Thank you. This is why we introduced a session this morning on the tr trying to think about the Middle East in, sure. in 30 years, uh, 30 years from, from now. Be be before I give the floor to, the, uh, to, to some uh, of uh, our members and participants, let me ask you to tell uh, very briefly uh, what do you expect from I say the Europeans. And when I say the Europeans, I am aware that talking about the Europeans is almost uh, as difficult as talking about the Arabs. Well, I'll tell you, and I'll... I started off by saying we're all in search of identity. From America right through the superpowers uh, into our region, but that also applies, frankly, in Europe. We look at Europe, our traditionally closest friends, and we just don't feel that you're giving us a clear message. Uh, and that's obvious. So we're actually engaging Europe quite strongly economically. But the debate on general policy issues is more formal than intense. I love to see uh, a stronger European engagement on how we work on the Mediterranean and then also on all the waterways because uh, the discussions over the last few days have shown, for example, the difficulties on supply chains and so, and so on. Um, and I'd emphasize again the point that we've been hearing throughout this conference. We're in this game all together. Nobody can say I'm going to stay out and then reap the benefits or isolate myself from the negative implications. So uh, you are, as Europeans, strong countries, healthy countries. You have good economies. Uh, you have your priorities. I grant you that. I don't want you to embrace ours. But there has to be a level of engagement that is much stronger than it is today. And I would argue here, I don't want to make you Egyptian, you should not try to make me French, but we should try to manage the optimum advantages we get in the relationship and then manage our differences so that they're not detrimental to each other. Uh, Europe, in, in all candidness, and I'll leave my diplomatic experience aside, you need to be a stronger player than where you are today. I agree. <laughs> Nabil, thank you very much.